So um, today we're going to go through four main themes or four modules. Um, so we're going to have a bit of an introduction to who we are and why we're here. We're going to have an introduction to disability, um, some disability terminology and ableism, and then some basic accessibility practices that you can start implementing into your science communication today. Um, so that's our agenda for today. And uh, before we get properly started, we're going to talk about how you can ask questions. So you can put it into the chat, which is visible to everybody. You can private message one of the speakers and we will read it out anonymously. Um, or you can use our Slido, which I'm going to put the link in the chat now. So if you click on that link and you put in the number 74 nine seven six six you will be able to ask questions completely anonymously um we will be able to see them but nobody else will and we won't be able to see who put them in so if you want to be completely anonymous you can feel free to do that um so uh that is uh, our introduction so let's uh move on to introducing our panelists so uh my name is linda corcoran i am an msc Math, research master's student in University College Cork in Ireland in food and nutritional sciences. My research looks at um, consumer liking and how it changes over the consumption of food products. And um, I am also involved in several nonprofits outside of my university work, um, including Disabled in Higher Ed, who everyone to here today is from. I'm also involved in PhD Balance and Dragonfly Mental Health. So I'm going to pass it over to Amanda to introduce herself. Thanks, Linda. Yeah, so hello, everybody. Uh, I was going to say good morning because I'm on the West Coast, but it's good afternoon, I think, for most people. Um, so yeah, my name is Amanda Klingler. Um, I am currently a graduate student at UCLA, um, and my research is focused on the effects of anthropogenic influences on animal behavior um, and how that might affect species survival um, in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology here. Um, and as Linda said, I'm also part of Disabled in Higher Ed. Um, I am a disabled woman. I have several disabilities uh, ranging from spondyloarthritis to Hashimoto's disease. Um, and I'm excited to be here and talk with y'all. Um, and with that, I think I'm passing it to Sarita, I believe. Yes, you are. And I have the same feeling as you. So welcome everyone with a good morning, but good whatever it is where you are. <laughs> so good day. So my name is Sarita Nolan. I am honored to be a part of Disabled in Higher Ed and one of our co-founders. And I'm currently at UC San Diego finishing up my bachelor's in human health psychology and working on my thesis in looking at universal preventive interventions in children under 13 to avert development of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. And in addition to work to finishing my bachelor's, I do a lot of amazing work within the disability community from disabled in higher ed to APHA disability. And I just love that I get to do this with amazing people like our co-presenters. So with that, I will pass it off to Alyssa. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Alyssa Paparella. My pronouns are she, her. I am currently a second year PhD student at Baylor College of Medicine in the Cancer and Cell Biology PhD program. I'm also the founder of Disabled in STEM, so I do a lot of disability advocacy and very happy to be part of the team for Disabled in Higher Ed. And that's a little bit about us, so now we can move on to some of more of the important things to discuss. Yeah, so to start off our discussion today, um, our presentation is going to be talking about access for disabled people. And so we first need to start off with talking about what is disability, right? How do we define that? Um, and so the US Center for Disease Control defines disability as any condition of the body or mind, which they refer to as an impairment um, that makes it more difficult to do certain activities, um, which they define as activity limitation um, and interact with the world. So participation restrictions. Um, and so any uh, condition could fall into this definition of disability, but there are a few things about this definition that I want to point out, um, such as the word impairment um, and activity limitation um, that kind of reflect how disability is often viewed in society um, and 
there's two different ways, primary ways to think about disability. Um, and one is the medical model, which this definition reflects, and the other is the social model. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about the distinction between those two things now and what they mean. So um, the medical model of disability essentially conceptualizes disability um, in the sense that it is, it is uh, a, a feature of a person. Um, the, the, per the problem is that the person is disabled, right? So the problem, as you can see here, is that the person uses a wheelchair so they can't get up the steps. Or the problem is that the person cannot walk and so they can't like make the long distance from the car to the store. Um, or the problem um, is that they um, cannot see the menu at the restaurant, right? So the medical model of disability um, conceptualizes disability as kind of um, a way, uh, like a suboptimal way of being human that causes problems for disabled people in society. Um, however, the social model of disability um, perceives the problem instead as the disabling world. Um, so you can see here, the problem would not be that somebody um, needs a wheelchair to move about. The problem is that the space is not wheelchair accessible, right? Or the problem is not that somebody cannot see the menu. But the problem is that there has not been a menu provided to them that they can access, right? Whether it be verbal or in braille or something of that nature, right? Um, and so this is a really important distinction to think about when we're talking about access and making programming and spaces accessible, right? Because uh, it's really different to view access as an extra mile you are going to provide it to a person who is or has a problem versus you creating a space that is accessible and inclusive to all who might wish to enter it. Um, and I think one really poignant example that helps highlight the um, social model of disability and, and the ways that this is kind of true and affects many of us um, is glasses, right? So like I wear glasses, I think many people um, most people I've encountered in my life need glasses or corrective eyewear to some extent, right? Um, but we do not view needing corrective eyewear as a disability. Why do we not view needing corrective eyewear as a disability in our society, right? Um, it's because glasses are um, widely available and accessible to people. Um, they provide a perfect accommodation for the disability, right? So you can get a glasses prescription that will return your vision to at or near 2020 vision. Uh, and there is no social stigma anymore about wearing glasses, right? In fact, many people buy fake glasses without corrective lenses in them for a fashion choice, right? And so even though if you didn't have your glasses, there would be many things that you would be physically unable to do, right? Like many people would be unable to drive or unable to read menus, right? Because you have been provided this perfect social accommodation that's accessible and non-judgmental, needing glasses or not having 20-20 vision is not something we as a society think of as a disability. Um, and so hopefully that helps put it in perspective, the idea of what we're talking about, right? So it's not, it's not a problem that your vision is not 20-20, it would be a problem that you can have your glasses, right? Um, and so thinking about, you know, how this idea of the social versus the medical model interacts with the way that we talk about access, the way that we talk about disability and disability uh, accommodations, um, there's a couple important things to touch on. Um, and one is that under the social model, disability um, is an identity, just like other identities, right? So the same way that members of our team are women and they're black and they're non-binary and they're bisexual, right? Those are all identities that we view as valid parts of our expression as people. Um, under the social model, disability is just another identity that you have, right? Um, and so <clears throat> when talking about disability, um, oftentimes um, able people, um, tend to use person first language. Um, and so person first language is saying um, a person with a disability, right? So putting the personhood before the condition or the disability. Um, and I know in spaces that I've worked in before, I've been explicitly taught to use this person first language um, because it's quote unquote more respectful, right? Because you're acknowledging somebody's personhood and humanity for their disability. Um, and while you should always ask disabled people what language they prefer, and there are some disabled people that do prefer person-first language, um, oftentimes when able people use person-first language, it is kind of this perpetuation of the medical model, right? The idea that disability is somehow inherently um, dehumanizing, right? And so you need to remind yourself that the disabled person is a person before they are something else, right? Um, and so the alternative to that is using identity first language, the same way we do for all of our other identities, right? And so this would be saying just a disabled person, the same way you would say 
a black woman or a non-binary person, right? Like the, the identity does not need to be qualified by the personhood. Um, and so, as I said, you should always confer with disabled people, which they prefer, um, but it, you know, oftentimes able people pushing the first person first language is indicative of that kind of like medical model. So other things to think about uh, with terminology and the way we talk about access um, is one thing often people will refer to wheelchair users as wheelchair bound, right? And so wheelchair bound gives this idea that the wheelchair um, is a limitation or a confinement when really people who use wheelchairs, the wheelchair is how they are able to participate in the world, right? And so um, like thinking about it in that way is not necessarily helpful, right? There's often the idea of um, like handicapped parking spaces or handicapped stalls or handicapped entrances. Um, what about the parking space is handicapped? Also the word handicapped is like not great. <laughs> um, it's not it's not a handicapped stall, right? Um, also um, people often refer to things as like cane and walkers or people will say physical ability. Um, and so instead you could say somebody is a wheelchair user, right? They use a wheelchair to facilitate their movement throughout the world. Um, you can refer to the stall or the parking space or the programming as accessible, right? Because that's what it is. It's accessible to people of all physical abilities, right? Um, you can also refer to things like canes and walkers instead of thinking of them as like stigmatized things, you can refer to them as mobility aids because that's what they are. They allow people to be mobile. Um, and also you can say, instead of physical ability, you can just say physical disability because disability is not, is not a bad word. Um, and at the bottom of this slide here, we have um, a whole comprehensive list of um, like ableist language in terms to avoid that you can look into more later. But we just wanted to highlight some of these common themes and kind of give examples of how um, the language that we use to discuss disability and accessibility is often informed by the medical model. Um, so essentially to conclude my portion of this talk is that when thinking about access and making our programs and spaces inclusive, we need to move away from medicalized language and perceptions of disabled people towards this social model where, you know, it is the space, it is the program, it is the thing, right, that is determining if somebody has access or not. And that is something that we have control over. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Sarita to talk about our next part. As we move toward this social model, it calls us to move away from medical models and seeing disability as limitation. And I think this calls us to really think about how we include or think about disability. Are we aware that disability exists? Because when we think of awareness, awareness is this knowledge that disabled people exist. Like you can have, I know, there's a disabled person here. It could be using more of that person first language because you don't feel like there is that identity that we hold. We, when we say disability awareness, this is a climate we have currently in higher education where we have diversity and equity statements that include disability, but it more feels like a performative allyship move where they're not actually meaningfully doing something to help improve the lives of disabled people across all career stages in higher education. Disability inclusion really speaks to actually putting the knowledge that you're gaining in spaces like these into the spaces that you inhabit, that you have power in to really invite disabled people to be equals in those spaces and actually taking actions that make sustainable changes that are not just driven by the labors of disabled people. Next slide, please. So medicalized language has a lot of roots in ableism. And as we see here in, from the Urban Dictionary, ableism is discrimination and prejudice against people who have disabilities. And this can take a lot of shapes of ideas and assumptions like stereotypes, like the ones we're talking about, like some of the language of wheelchair bound is an example of ableist language. It can take, it can take form as attitudes and practices like disabled people don't belong in STEM. And we see a lot of the amazing work that Alyssa does that's trying to transform that. The physical barriers that we have in our environment and not welcoming us into our, that environment and the larger scale oppression that really 
is all of these barriers that we continue to face, all of everything that requires disabled people to be resilient and to be celebrated for being resilient when we're only just trying to survive in the environments that we're in and that we don't have the tools to thrive because of systemic forms of ableism. Next slide, please. So when we think about ableism, this is unchecked in our system throughout various ways. Being Black, like there's many ways institutions will, will talk about racism. Like here at UCSD, we had a 21 day anti-racism challenge. As much as I don't know how much that will actually substantially change things, we don't talk about ableism. I don't think there's any institution that actually talks openly about ableism. If one of your institutions talk about ableism openly, feel free to share it in the chat. I'd love to know about it. But we don't really challenge ableism. So since we don't challenge it, it's unchecked. It can grow, it can thrive, it can take new forms. It can mean that even if we have accommodations in a space, it doesn't mean that an instructor cannot be openly ableist and disrespectful and making us feel less than for being in a space as a disabled person, as a disabled woman, and it compounds upon other identities. And there's no really one correct verbiage. Like when we talk about ableism, it can take a lot of forms, like just some of the examples that Amanda covered. And it is about really thinking about how we use our words and the impact that they have just as much as we think about the words we use about different cultures, disability is a culture too. And respecting our culture, who we are as people, and being willing to accept disability pronouns that we share. Like that is one example of ableism as well. Like if a disabled person was to say, I identify as a disabled woman, invisibly disabled and neurodivergent as I do, I've had instructors in psychology say, oh no, it's people with disabilities. But that's not right. It's able us to try to say, to correct disability pronouns when you'd never do that to gender pronouns. So always taking that time to learn and be respectful makes a difference and using your power to help others do the same. Next slide, please. So why is it important to implement accessible practices in SciComm? Disabled people exist. And not only do we exist, we're 25% of the population and we deserve equal access. When as a um, co-chair of, of APHA Disability and Communications, I handle our Twitter a lot and so many public health agencies do not practice accessible SciComm throughout COVID, posting all these detailed graphics and we don't have that same access and it's not fair and it's not right. And I thank each and every one of you for being here and learning about how to make our access equal as disabled people. So next slide, please. So here's some accessibility issues that are very common, like alt text. So Twitter has a function to add alt text to any image. And for example, we have here on the left, this is a picture of a flash flood watch. It's Tuesday afternoon through Thursday afternoon in these certain areas. So much information in here without alt text. I, let's say I was going through with my screen reader on Twitter and I come across this image and it has no alt text. All it will say is image. As a person using a screen reader, I deserve to have the information to be safe. I deserve to have the information to know where we are in COVID. It creates a cited privilege that drives that someone else that cited will just share with the person using a screen reader what they missed, but we live independently as disabled people and we should be able to access information independently as well. And that's what alt text really empowers screen reader screen readers to be able to do, to read out exactly what I see, like the example of what I said of flash flood of watch and different areas and stuff, something detailed that conveys the same thing that's in the image out being read. 
that is the heart of alt text and image descriptions that we'll go into later. And then there's plain language, like how many people actually love doing taxes, understand the tax forms entirely? Oh, taxes are just so easy, right? Like, no, I hate taxes. <laughs> like it's written in Greek, English Greek. But when we're writing like tw tweets and reaching out in SciComm, if we're not using plain language and we're using our industry jargon, we may not be able to have everyone hear and understand the message we're trying to convey. So that's why plain language is so important because SciComm is communications that are not intended just for a scientific community, but for those in the public who don't understand the terms in depth as much as we do. So whenever possible, let's make the language as clear for everyone, not just your field. And next slide, please. So on Twitter, we also have accessibility issues in hashtags. Like we see in this Twitter, in this tweet from Christine Cornish of life-changing tip alert, go to R, go to the code tab, insert section, and then code tab again, show document outline and share this with every grad student, you know, I don't know R, but like the collection of hashtags she includes, academic Twitter, it has the capitalized words in there that will be read fine by a screen reader. Academic chatter, both words are capitalized, that will be read fine by a screen reader. But we get to PhD chat. Since this is all in lowercase, a screen reader will read that as one word. I don't know how this one word will sound, but it may not convey the same meaning that we see of this word. And the same likely could happen to grad school. I don't know what would happen with that, but <laughs> it would also likely be butchered by a screen reader that cannot tell the signaling of where the beginning of each word is due to the lack of having the first letter of each word capitalized. This is known as camel case. So practicing really being accessible in hashtags is critical. And I also wanted to highlight this new trend on Twitter as well of the red flags, which is a red flag for accessibility because the screen reader reads every instance of a red flag. So for example, this a screen reader might read this as red flag on post, red flag on post, red flag on post, red flag on post. Do you think you might be stressed Red flag on post, red flag on post, red flag on post, red flag on post. Oh my gosh, if I was listening to a screen reader, that would be awful. Like even it's awful trying to say that. <laughs> so yeah, so whenever you see someone engaging in the red flag like trend, please tell them to stop and not do it. <laughs> it's important that we are accessible and mindful of how screen readers will read out hashtags and the emojis that we choose to use. And also we have captions and subtitles, which are critical to really be able to include the deaf community within like any, any audio communications. And Brazil actually did a lot of COVID communications without even thinking of the deaf community. How many communications, how many people in SciComm really go about making images, making graphs, making posts without thinking of the deaf or disabled communities that need access to that information. Without accessibility, you only reach 75% of your audience. Is that good enough? Next slide. And I think that would be the end of my section. Yes. So I'll be passing it to Alyssa, I believe. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to do it next, and then Alyssa's going to take over from me. So um, we're going to talk about some of the basic accessibility practices that uh, Sarita just went through and how you can implement it yourself in your own work. So we are absolute advocates for what was called universal design. And some of you who are maybe in academia or have been in academia and research may have heard of this in terms of universal design learning for classrooms and uh, courses. But universal design as a concept goes past this. Um, and it is for 
the entirety of society. And the principle of universal design is to make everything accessible for everyone before you have to ask for it. So that you implement the accessibility into your plan, you implement the accessibility from the start, and then you're not going back later and saying, this is taking so much time to add this accessibility because it's already there. You've already know where it's going. You already have planned for it in the budget. You already have planned time and people that it takes and you know what experts you need to get because it's already there. It's in your plan. And um, so uh, I guess next slide to start some of our basic. So some of the basic terms you need for dealing with accessibility, we're gonna go through. So the first one is screen readers. And I know Sarita already mentioned this, but screen readers are assistive technology for the blind or for those with low vision. And also for those who are blind, deaf, who are deaf blind, sorry. Um, and um, also people with dyslexia will use them as well. And this converts our written content also are all text and transcriptions into speech or braille. So literally it will read it for those people and it will convert it into the speech or the braille as necessary. Um, next we have all text and all text is a written description of an image, graphic, GIF or any multimedia content that screen reader tools will use to describe images to visually impaired readers. Camel case is where you capitalize the first word of, or the first letter of each word in a hashtag. You can also do this for emails and websites as they are not case sensitive and it makes it much easier to read. Um, next slide. Um, then we move on to our caption subtitles and cars. So we have, in this session today, we have a live transcriber. We have a live, so we have what is known as communication access real-time translation. And this is called CART, C-A-R-T. So this is where we have a trained professional who is translating the spoken word into written uh, captions in real time. And um, this uh, is expensive because it, is, uh, it takes a lot of training to be able to do something like this. Um, and uh, it is also very, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, brain. <laughs> it is the uh, very, it, it, is a, it takes a lot of capacity to do this properly. <laughs> um, then we have captions. So captions are, on-screen text descriptions, which include the words spoken and any other relevant sounds. So if we were to do something, or if um, in the background of my me speaking, someone was to ring the doorbell or to knock on the door, to put those into the transcript, into, into the words that are, are flashing up on screen, this is where we call captions. And um, this is different from subtitles because in subtitles, you only have the words spoken. You don't have this extra information. And this gives it extra um, context cues. And it just lets people know who can't hear what is going on around this because there's often a lot of, of audio context clues when we're doing something like watching a television show or a series or a video. Um, and then transcripts are unsynchronized text descriptions, and they can be presented as a downloadable text or word file or Google Doc. And this is all of the spoken word, and it can often include the on text, um, on screen text descriptions, not on screen text descriptions, sorry, ring, um, the re other relevant sounds like the doorbell ringing, et cetera. And, it, what it is, is it is just a document of everything that happened in that video or audio clip. Okay, next slide. So um, let's talk a little bit about plain language. So you often hear the words plain language thrown around, um, but true plain language is to make things accessible and to make things understandable for everyone. So if something is truly written in plain language, anyone 
who speaks the language would be able to pick it up and understand what it is talking about. And this true Paleo language is extremely important for the likes of government reports, um, or a, if we, I know it, they don't always happen, but it should happen. So if you have a public report, if you have a public um, media release, it should really be in plain language because we want everyone to understand it. This is especially important for public health, for the likes of vaccines, for anything to do with public health nutrition, <laughs> basically just everything that we want people to understand. And um, it's very, very important that if you are working in a discipline like this, that if your layperson release is not in true plain language, you also have a plain language release. And plain language is a skill. Very few people can do it properly. Um, and unfortunately, there is very little standardization across countries on this. So um, because language itself and standardization of language and what is quality language is subjective, plain language tends to be a bit subjective as well. Um, so that is a bit unfortunate, but um, the, some tips to get started is using only common words. If you are using jargon, you are explaining what it is. You're giving that context. You are using shorter sentences, but you're also varying the length of your sentences from short to medium so that it reads well. It's very important when you are using, that you're including more white space and you are in, using structure. So we have an introduction, we have a, a middle paragraph, and then we have a conclusion for everything. And that you're using the active voice over the passive voice. And maybe you're saying things like, you're using the first person. So instead of saying, the students will learn X, Y, and Z, you will say, you will learn X, Y, and Z. And that is just getting people, um, that is just implementing plain language in little ways. So it is something that can be learned over time, but it is definitely difficult. It's something I want to get better at, um, but it takes time. So next slide. Okay, so we're going to talk about colorblindness. So colorblindness is something that some people may be familiar with. It's getting more popular um, as uh, an accessibility measure that people are aware of. So um, there are a whole bunch of different types of colorblindness. But the thing is, uh, colorblindness is a spectrum, or sorry, color is a spectrum. Um, so when we think of green, blue colorblindness, when we think of red, green, red, blue colorblindness as the, are the most common ones. It's not just those colors that are affected because all of our other colors are made up of the colors that are affected. <laughs> so um, for example, if green is affected, or if you're a green, blue colorblindness, your green is affected, your blue, pink, purple, red, and a little bit on the orange is also affected. So, um, when we are looking at graphs, when we're looking at figures, sometimes you just don't know what is the best um, colors to put in to make sure it's accessible. And um, here is an example of one, what is called the Izahara test. And um, I use this quite commonly in my um, field because we do uh, colorblindness tests. And um, this just shows kind of uh, there is a 74 in this one, and it is made up of uh, different color green dots, and then the outside is made up of red and orange dots. And um, yes, um, so it it's it can be hard to figure out what kind of colors that you need. So um, next slide there. A good solution is to stay along one color, but make sure that your colors are, are, are varied enough, that there's enough distance between them that they can still be seen. So here is an example of a random graph I made up um, with, that is made up of bars of uh, three different trials, and there's three different purple colors on the screen. So um, when we look at this, these colors should be different enough that even if someone was colorblind, even if purple was affected, 
they should be able to see it. So we're thinking about contrast here. And um, if we move on to the next slide, a good way to test your colors, if you are not sure, is to change it to grayscale. And you should be able to easily see the difference between all of your colors that you're using. If you can't, you need to change it because it's not going to be able to be seen. And um, you are, there's also different color, um, there's also different contrast che checkers and color blindness checkers online that you can upload your image to if you're really unsure and you're not sure if the contrast is enough. So you just Google um, contrast checker, color blindness checker, and they will come up for you. And next slide. And I'm gonna hand it over to Alyssa. Thank you for that, Linda. So I'm gonna be talking about a little more in depth about alt text and image descriptions because what is the difference? There actually is a difference. So alt text is a brief textual explanation of an image, where an image description is a detailed explanation of an image that provides more complete information of what is actually happening. And then you may have also heard of image captions. So image captions are a brief explanation that provides further information about an image. So think about figure titles in like a scientific paper if you were reading. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what's the difference? Now let's kind of use this as an example and see. So on the left here, we have an image. So our alt text of this image would be the disabled and higher ed logo. So you're not really getting too much from that. There's no concept behind it. It just says the bare minimum, where if you go to an image description now, you're getting more and gonna actually understand what is part of that logo. So this image description would be disabled and higher ed logo of a white mortar graduation cap outlined in gray with the words disabled and higher ed floating above. So from the image description, you get a lot more from it rather than just having your alt text. Next slide. So how do we make your work accessible? So just some basics. Here's some steps to write alt text and image descriptions. So the first thing is context is everything. So it really depends on what you wanna show. You wanna ask yourself, what is the point of the image that you are showing? You also wanna concentrate on that. So whatever the focus of the image is, is what you should be using to describe. So you briefly describe the rest, but focus on what your whatever message you're trying to provide. So this includes also writing on images. So on the right of the screen here, we have an image. So this image could be described in a multitude of different ways, depending on what the focus is that you're trying to describe to your audience. So there's a person there. So you could say, oh, there is a young adult, African-American male in yellow on the beach. So that's if I wanted to say, hey, that's my friend and want to describe that. Also, the way the image is taken, you could do it in a different way. You could say, pictured is a beach with a few people on it and also prominently featuring a man. So this description is more, you're actually describing the beach and the background, so you're making that your focus rather than the man himself. So this is really dependent on what you're trying to provide to your audience in this image. So you don't want to disregard any of these, but you actually want to use what your focus of your image is to help describe and provide more context for your audience. Next slide. So some exceptions. Um, there's also uh, decorative images. So this does not add anything to understanding. It kind of just looks pretty. And there's also images just containing text when all text is in the accompanying caption or piece. So on the left here, we have an image of somebody holding a piece of paper in between their fingers. It looks like their thumb and maybe their forefinger. The background is a blurred green and on written lined paper, it says you are the only exception with a little red heart. Okay, next slide. So here's kind of how to add alt text. This is example from Twitter specifically. So on Twitter, you're able to add up to 1,000 characters to describe your images, which is a lot compared to other social media. And that's important because it's giving you more room to actually describe what is happening and you're not limited. So how to do that is you have on your left side, I don't know 
a pointer, I just realized. On the left, the first image, <laughs> thanks Amanda, um, you have the option to add a description or also edit. If you go under edit, it then allows you to put your alt text in and you're able to type your 1000 characters. And sometimes people forget how to add alt text or they just don't remember when you're adding an image, you're just really excited to post this beautiful graph you got, but you forget. So when that happens, or if you're a bit newer to using alt text, you may want to download a free extension for Chrome and it's called Twitter required alt text. So when you have this extension downloaded, it's going to tell you, hey, you need to post that alt text in order to post your image. So this is a way to make sure even if you forget that the images and content you're posting is accessible because it will remind you and not let you post unless it's accessible. Next slide. There's the little highlights. <laughs> so for social media, just some key takeaways and what you guys wanna think about when you're thinking about using social media as a platform for your science communication. You wanna think about contrast and legibility of fonts in your graphics and make sure that people are able to see them. You wanna make sure you use alt text or image descriptions as required. So we just went over how to do that. So you guys should know at least for Twitter now. You also want to have subtitles and closed captionings for videos. So often people make videos and if they don't have any captions, people are not able to fully understand what is happening. So this benefits not only the disability community, but also people who are just learning the language and it may help them also. So that's a better practice for everyone and not just the disability community. You also want to link, link transcripts for longer videos. And we want to talk about having those camel case hashtags. So just as a reminder, that's capitalizing every letter of a new word. So example for that, we have accessibility matters where the A and M would be capitalized and not all lowercase because just as a reminder, a screen reader would read it all as one word, which makes it much more difficult to understand. And you also want to use shorter links if possible. So tiny URL and bit.ly are two examples to kind of make your URLs shorter and easier. Next slide. So now we also wanted to talk about if you were planning an in-person event, how is your accessibility and thinking important for that. So first you wanna think about the space and the room setup. So first you wanna ensure a physically accessible space. So I am personally a cane user. So there are so many spaces where people are like, oh, there's only just a few stairs to get into the space. And I'm like, but that's not accessible. So you wanna make sure that it is accessible for uh, wheelchair users, so say there's ramps possible and there's also elevators. I also always recommend checking to make sure the elevator is working, not just saying, hey, we know we have an elevator. Is it actually working and functional? You also want to make sure that there's seating for all attendees, so nobody has to stand. There is seating available. You want to think about all exercises and group work. Can everybody reasonably do it? Is this preventing anybody from participating? Would that cause further stigma? Is your work inclusive for all? And you also want to think of your room setup. How is your stage set up? Do you have microphones available? The type of work? Um, as a big point number two, you want to ask people if Excel accessibility needs are required prior to the event. You don't want somebody to have to go there and worry about it. Am I going to have an accessible time at this event? Am I going to be able to have seating available? You should ask this on your events prior so people can tell you if anything is needed and you could plan accordingly. If somebody else is hosting the event, it's always good to remind the host to ask and say, hey, I didn't see you ask about access accessibility. Can we please ask about it? Or what accessible measures are you taking? Also, what I hate personally, and I love that we don't have in-person conferences anymore, I hate when that one person gets up in the conference and they're like, oh, I don't need the microphone. I'm loud. And I'm like, honey, you're not as loud as you think you are, first off. <laughs> so they're, they're screaming in the back and they're like, oh, can you hear me? And of course, if you're in the back, you're not going to say no. So they just let this usually white male talk however he wants without a microphone. This is just not accessible. If there's a microphone there, straight up just use the microphone. Like there's no reason. Like you may think you're loud, but it's just being an ally and helping others using a microphone. It's just an easy practice. So please use a microphone. <laughs> and also, what's very helpful for events is to also send slides or other materials available ahead of time to participants so people are able to look it through prior and follow along during the presentation. Next slide, please. 
So what's needed at all virtual meetings? First, you need you and your participation. You also need to make sure your slides and agenda are accessible. You wanna make sure that you have a microphone or headset available. So this is also both for online conferences too. Microphones are very important and we should consider using them more. Um, you also wanna make sure that there's good lighting. So this wants to be coming from behind the camera so the person could be illuminated and there's not casting a dark shadow and people are able to make out the person who's talking. You also wanna have a green screen or suitable background. You don't want too much going on in the background that may be distracting for your audience members. So I chose an office room that was a white background because it was pretty basic. You also wanna be able to send the agenda, agenda ahead of time if possible. So this allows people to know kind of what's going on and gives them the ability to follow along during the talk. Also, when it comes to having an online event, it's great to have cameras on, but it should not be required. You should always give people the ability to have their cameras off. They might not be in the environment where they are able to turn a camera on, or they may be resting or just not feel comfortable for doing so. So having the option to have your camera off is an accessible practice that benefits everyone. And also having multiple ways of communicating and asking questions. So as you guys may have remembered when we started, we gave the ability to ask either in the Zoom chat. We also said that you guys may message any of us speakers and ask a question. And then we also gave the Slido option, which has the ability to have anonymous questions. So this is trying to take into consideration everyone's different needs and comfort level with asking questions. Next slide, please. So some big takeaways. Accessibility is a skill set. It's not one of those things where you could learn it and then just say, hey, I'm done. I'm now an accessible science communicator. My job here is done. It's a lifelong process where you need to continuously learn and seek out material to make sure that the practices still are accessible and that social media and other things are not changing. You can start small. So maybe just by adding alt text, challenge yourself to say, I'm going to add alt text to all of my images I post from now on. This is just starting small. And as you build one accessible practice, it leads the way to having more confidence to include other accessible practices in the future. You must be willing to continue to learn and improve. No one's gonna be amazing with it the first time. So you must also be willing to get feedback. So that kind of brings us to the, if things don't go right, you cannot get defensive. If somebody points out, hey, I know you might've wanted to have alt text, but it didn't show up on your image. You should be willing to take that and say, thank you for pointing that out. Don't try and start an argument. The best practice to do in that case is delete the previous tweet and then add alt text and post it new. And a commitment to accessibility takes time and you must keep up with it. So it's definitely an added layer, but your added layer is making sure it is accessible to 25% of the population. So that's a pretty big portion when it comes to your science communication and something you definitely want to take into consideration to considerization at all times with your science communication and practices. Next slide. And with that, once again, it's all of us. So thank you so much to also being here as an audience member and thank you to all my wonderful other speakers willing to share their experiences and help us create this wonderful opportunity to share some science communication practices. Um, once again, we are all part of Disabled in Higher Ed. So you could follow Disabled in Higher Ed to learn more about our work. And we also have all of our own Twitters with our little uh, apps that you could follow. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much again, everybody. I see the chat is blowing up, but I have not been looking at it, if I'm honest. <laughs> I have been looking at it. Um, I'm probably going to go backwards order. So we had from, from Madison, uh, how would you handle acronyms? Should it be STEM education with education capitalized or STEM education without education capitalized? Would you like to take this one to see it in chat, Linda, and also show the questions? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, with with um, acronyms, you should always capitalize the acronym because they are for an individual word. And um, even though some acronyms maybe might make sense or might sound okay when they're read out, I not all of them do. So ideally capitalize every acronym and then capitalize all of your words.
And I think another important question for us to address came from Madison as well of, do you have any recommendations of how to create the equivalent of captions for visual text on video? For example, if you were watching a video where text appears on screen, but isn't spoken or heard. Thinking that would go in the lines of a video description, but I'm a little torn. So anyone else like to take this one? Yes. So usually when I have uh, when I have videos where there is text on screen that's not spoken, I make a, a, a recording over it of me or someone else speaking the words just so it's clear um, because it's 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 important. Uh, these are usually used as transition pieces or to introduce a new topic. And it's just as important to get that across to other people as well. just catching up on the chat but I just wanted to say thank you everybody for having so much discussion and conversation also in the chat it's great to see the participation yes the participation is just so pleasant to see I, there's a question from Carolyn of could you offer some advice on disclosing disability in job applications especially in science careers um, and then she continued to say, when job applications ask whether I have any disabilities, I'm often unsure of how that information is received, which is tangled into my own feelings about my own mental health and disability, and wanting to decide how people know about me in different contexts. I could take a crack at this question. So when I was applying to graduate school, I kind of really wrestled with that question of, do I disclose my disability or do I not? Is this going to influence their decision? I ended up going with disclosure because for me, it was important to find an institution that would be acceptable and inclusive of my disability. So I wanted them to know about that ahead of time and that not prevent them from including me or wanting me in their program. So it's definitely a personal decision though. There's no like right way to go about doing it or disclosing or not. So I think it just comes down to understanding what benefit do you think you would get from it so for me personally, when I show up to an interview, I have my cane. So it kind of also outs me as being disabled to begin with. So I feel like that changes people's perspective and it feels like I'm hiding something if I don't tell them ahead of time. So because my disability identity is so important to who I am as a person, I tend to shape it into my statement of how I became interested in science and how it has shaped me into a better scientist. So I use my disability as a stepping stone to show that I am an individual and how that benefits me and potentially the organization that I'll be part of. But that's just my opinion. There's no right answer here. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very important to say that it is a very difficult decision. It's something that I, I think I have reversed myself um, over the last few years because um, I'm not in a much better position now, but I'm in a better financial position than I used to be a couple of years ago. And a couple of years ago, I would never have disclosed because I was terrified of not having a job, not getting the job and not being able to survive. So being someone who doesn't look disabled, who unless maybe you meet me on a very bad day, um, I could let's say get away with that I know that's not the right way to say it but I never used to disclose and the concept of disclosure was terrifying to me um in the past maybe two two and a bit years um I've kind of reversed that because I'm in a better position financially where if I didn't get a job right away I would be okay but also about half my CV now is disability stuff. So either they understand that I'm disabled or they think I'm the greatest ally ever. <laughs> <laughs> you that. are the greatest ally ever. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess that that's a really good point. Um, and I, I will say, yeah, I, to join both of like what Alyssa and Linda said, like when I applied to grad school, I also disclosed just because going to grad school is something that like, like the relationship you have with your PI, at least in sciences, right, is like really important. And it's really like determinant for like how your life is going to go. So like making sure that, that environment was one that was going to be supportive of like my full personhood and my identity was like, it was important for me to disclose that because I didn't want to spend, you know, five years somewhere that 
I couldn't talk about that or I wouldn't be accommodated to that, right? But I do think that if I was just gonna apply for a job, I don't know that I would click yes, right? Because like they could decide to not hire me exclusively based on that. And like, you know, like Linda said, like if you need a job, you need a job, right? And like, they can decide to not hire you and just, just like claim another reason, right? But they can't fire you after the fact. So, um, you know, I mean, technically they can, they still probably would. But, you know, that's another conversation about like legality in the ADA in the US and we don't need to go there right now, right? But so yeah, I think it's complicated and it's up to you. And it's also very context dependent, right? Because like Alyssa said, when it's like a personal statement with someone you're gonna work with as a mentor and like you can explain how it affects it, it's different than like the box on a job application, right? Where it's just completely out of context, like, yes, I'm disabled and they don't even know like what that means. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and for me, when I was applying to grad school, it was important to disclose though I didn't get in, and it was this choice that they made, like, I got my feedback back, and they're like, I don't know if you're more interested in advocacy or research, and oh my gosh, it frosted my cookies a lot, but I think that be being a disability advocate and having that on a CV, there, it almost becomes like, you have, like, I felt like it's something I need to do because it's not something I'm willing to hide about myself and not say, because it is important to me in the lens which I bring to my graduate school education, but it might not be the lens I bring to a job. <laughs> so that definitely would influence my choice on that as well. And um, we had another question in the chat as well from Lizette about, Friends, where do we get a screen reader? Yes, screen readers. So proper screen readers, like um, really good screen readers that um, people who are blind or have low vision or people who are dyslexic would use are very expensive. But you can get partial screen readers that don't um, read automatically. So expensive screen readers read automatically. You turn on your computer, they start. They read absolutely everything. They tell you what windows are open. They tell you if a notification goes off on a window that's not open. And it's just constant. Whereas a partial screen reader is like is usually installed on your computer. It's usually under what is called narrator. And you can turn that on. And um, they only tend to work if you click on something. And they'll only read what you click on. So they can be there. It, it takes a while to get used to them, but most computers tend to have them installed. There are free apps on your phone that you can download. Um, but again, they tend to be only partial screen readers and they're not great. But they can be a useful way as somebody who's making content for screen readers, because you can't like if you don't need the screen reader to access the content, like you can see it. If you just want to know like what this will sound like to a screen reader, like for example, like the example with the tweet we brought up, like if you wanna know, like what does this sound like to someone who uses a screen reader, that's an excellent way for you as an ally to check to make sure things are accessible without paying for the full software. Exactly, and I also wanna say thank you for Danielle posting in the chat about nvaccess.org slash download of being able to use that to test. It's a donate as you can option. So being able to have that and, also, when I looked into screen readers for myself with um, my Office of Students with Disabilities, they said that Apple had a built-in thing, I think voiceover, but I don't know how well it works because I never <laughs> like um, initialized it because I was concerned about how it worked. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think what I meant by it, they're, they're not great is um, if you're not used to screen readers, they can be very frustrating because you think you've clicked on a whole sentence and then it only reads out two words. <laughs> so they can take getting used to. So yeah, I think we're coming up on time, but if anyone yeah. has any last minute questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. Or if you um, want to reach out to us privately afterwards, you can feel free to do that. All of our personal Twitters are there. You can also reach out to the at this in higher ed Twitter, D-I-S-I-N-H-I-G-E-R-E-D. Or you can contact our email, which is disabledinhighered at gmail.com. 
and um, we will feel free, we will absolutely answer your question. And if you want to learn more about disabilities and higher education, we are running Disabled Empowerment and Higher Education Month this month, and we have two more weeks. This coming week, we're focusing on mental illness and minority stress, and then the week after, we're focusing on marginalization and accommodations, so you will be able to learn more. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming.